Ladies and gentlemen, dear Ronald Lauder, I'm deeply moved by your words. They were so heartfelt, so sincere, and I am so proud to have been asked to become honorary vice chairman of this remarkable institution, the World Jewish Congress. I'm deeply honored also with this award because Theodor Herzl is not just a figure in the tribal annals of the Jewish people, he's also a world figure, but for me personally, the man, his message means a great deal and permeated my personal life, my political life, my professional life. I'm a lifelong Zionist brought up in Austria. I had the great good fortune to serve in the BBC in an enormously important job in the last few years as a diplomatic correspondent attached to the so-called freedom movements and European governments in exile. That is, that is to say, I had to get stories out of the Free French and the Gold, Sikorsky, Benish, but also the freedom movements, the free Indians, the free Africans, and the Zionist organization. And there, of course, I met the old friends and made new friends, Weizmann, Ben-Gurion, Charette, and so on. But Theodor Herzl meant so much to me. He permeated my life, also my professional life. In the 70 years of publishing, I published three biographies of Herzl. The last one has only just appeared, published by the, the, written by that great uh, historian, philosopher, and diplomat, Shlomo Avineri. But the man, his message, meant a great deal to me because of three aspects that are so important. He was, for me, the last of the great Hebrew prophets. He was for me also the great redeemer who managed to make some of his prophets, uh, prophecies come true. And he was for me also the apostle to the Gentiles. You see, the extraordinary thing about Herzl was that here was a man who moved mountains and had a very short life. He died at the age of 44. But that's not all. Only in the last seven, eight, nine years was he aware he was Jewish. I mean, he was assimilated, he was emancipated. Of course, he knew he was Jewish, but he had no feeling for the Jewish people, not very much. For one moment, as an undergraduate and member of a very feudal, elegant student corps, he experienced anti-Semitism because it the age of 23, in 83, 1883, two waves of anti-Semitism swept through Austria, a plebeian and a patrician one. The plebeian one was run by that mayor of Vienna, Luega, the first of modern anti-Semitic politicians, and who, who, who mobilized the lower middle classes and had a strong anti-Semitic background, and the patrician one were the haute bourgeoisie, more than the aristocracy, and they were pan-German. They despised the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. They wanted the Anschluss, and they were anti-Semitic. And so when he was an undergraduate, he had this awful experience that he was asked to resign from his corps because the Albia, this, this very feudal student corps, decided the Jews had to resign. They formed a cartel of student corps known as the Weithofen Cartel, named after a small village near Vienna, where the old said, the Jew is not a gentleman, you mustn't give him satisfaction, he must get out. But his reaction was very odd. He didn't immediately think he was going to be a Zionist, on the contrary. He thought, well, mass conversion, let's all be baptized, or Forgive, for, find some way of disappearing, and then forgot about it, and things ca calmed down in Austria. And then much later, when he 
who was then in his mid-30s, and as you know, he died at the age of 44. In his mid-30s, his newspaper, because he's one of the great journalists, playwrights, even the Imperial Work Theater played his plays. He was sent to Paris to cover the Dreyfus trial. And that was a decisive event. After a day in court, when he suddenly realized there in the land of the free, liberté, égalité, fraternité, a Jewish officer of the upper middle class was accused of being a traitor and sending his country to the enemy. There, he experienced a form of anti-Semitism that was really hurting. And one day, as he walked across the bridge of the Seine to his hotel, always impeccably dressed, top coat, a, a, a long beard, he looked like an Assyrian prince, a Semitic experience, a, a, out, out, uh, he walked back to his hotel and on the way two street urchins ran after him and said, Sal Juif, Sal Juif. And he was so shattered that he, had him, that he locked himself up for three days, asked the porter to bring up food and wrote a science fiction political pamphlet called the Jewish State. Political Zionism, the Jews must have a state in Palestine. When that pamphlet was published, and by the way, an English version appeared in the Jewish Chronicle at the time, when it was published, the reaction was terrible. The wealthy Jews, the liberal uh, public said, what is this extraordinary thing? He wants to suggest mass exodus of Jews in Austria. This is terrible. This will lead to more anti-Semitism. But the Jews in the eastern provinces of Austria-Hungary, in today's Ukraine and Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary, read it and were absolutely fascinated. And he got letters and asked to give lectures. And he took three weeks off and went on a lecture tour. And as he, his train left the Austrian heartland, and went into the eastern marches. Every station were red carpets, hundreds, in some cases thousands of Jews, wearing the transparency of his photograph with the inscription, Long live Herzl, King of the Jews. That was the beginning of the world Zionist movement. And then extraordinary things happened. In a ridiculously short time, he created a movement. An unbelievable situation. No examples, only very few. They were, even those were quite different and pale. Alexander the Great died at the age of 33, but he was the son of a great warrior king with an army. At the age of 19, 20, 21, he was already running campaigns. In the world of cultural music, Mozart, Schubert had died young, but they were wunderkinder. They produced classics when they were toddlers. But Herzl only realized that there was a Jewish problem a few years before he died. And he created in a feverish way this World Zionist movement. And so for me, he is three things. He's the last of the Hebrew prophets. He is the great deliverer, the redeemer, because so much that he prophesied became truth, some of it even while alive but most of it in the years after his death. And thirdly, for me, he is the apostle to the Gentiles. And this is the most extraordinary experience. And so he also dominated my life. I think to understand what it all meant and how quickly he succeeded in doing what he did, let me take you on a flight of fancy between reality and fancy. I'm going to be 96 in a few months' time. Assuming I was born in 1990. Assuming for a moment, I had been born in 1877. And I would have been 20 years as a student and gone to the first Congress in Baal. Together with a few students, 
and young intellectuals, and not with the Jewish elite at all, with idealists. And Herzl would have said to me, next to others, hire yourself a dress suit, hire yourself a silver top cane stick, and come and join this, this Congress. And then he hired a band, and what did the band play? A potpourri of Richard Wagner. Twelve years after Richard Wagner's publication of his anti-Semitic essay, The Juden in the Musik, The Jews in Music. Don't ask me to explain it. These are the mysteries of Zeitgeist. There is an explanation, but it's for another lecture. Now, so what happened? I would have been then at the Congress. Twenty years later, the Balfour Declaration. He was already dead, but his successors did it for him. And I would have probably then been able to stand outside number 10 Downing Street, jubilant that the Jews now had the Balfour Declaration. Thirty years after that, I would still be in the ripe age, and then comes the real fact. I was already there. The State of Israel was proclaimed by the United Nations at Lake Success. Twenty years after that, the Six-Day War, when I spent the fourth and fifth day of the Six-Day War as the guest of General Herzog, later President Herzog, the first governor of the old city of Jerusalem, and we had two nights of unforgettable experiences. It was the fourth and the fifth night, and among the guests were journalists like Randolph Churchill and his son Winston Jr. and Lady Pamela Berry, the wife of the proprietor of the, the Telegraph, and some very distinguished military critics, some of them former generals of the army. And we were discussing the war. And Randolph Churchill turned to Moshe Dayan, who passed by to the dinner party, and said, General Dayan, tell me, I want to know, I've studied what you did in the south in the Egyptian campaign, when you were uh, tanks, and you didn't have too many tanks, recklessly drove into the infantry of the enemy without infantry backing on your side. And Dayan, quietly, in his deadpan way of talking, said, but Mr. Churchill, we had infantry. We had wonderful regiments. I can give you the names. Belsen, Buchenwald, Meidenach, Auschwitz. That was our infantry. Can there be better regiments than that? And on the fifth day, we were having dinner, and an orderly came and whispered something into the ear of General Herzog. And General Herzog got up, choking with emotion, and said, gentlemen, we have scaled the Golden Heights. I might say the war is over. Now, I'll tell you the story for the following reason. I could have still been there for a few years. In other words, within one lifetime, through Herzl, prophecy turned into victory, independence, and recognition. Because the week after the Six-Day War, a man like Little Hart, the great military critic, a man like Vladimir Dormesson, a French literary critic, the uncle of the famous writer, wrote almost the same article. We must admit in all seriousness that the new Israeli army is probably the finest fighting force in the world today. That was Theodor Herzl's legacy. So I say to you how Herzl, what he meant to me, how important it is. And now I want to talk to you quickly about Herzl as not only as the Redeemer, the Redeemer who redeemed so many of his promises, but also as the Apostle to the Gentiles. Because he was not just a tribal figure, he worked on the world stage. And he wished to make friends with non-Jews. He was able to go and see not only friends, on the contrary, he went the Tsarist Minister of the Interior, responsible for pogroms. He went to see the Pope, who wasn't particularly friendly, 
those days, he saw the French, he saw the British, even some American politicians, and he made friends. And now the first Zionist of Christian persuasion was an English clergyman called the Reverend Heckler. His Reverend Heckler was the first non-Jew who saw the point. And he became a court preacher of the Grand Duke of Baden, who in turn was the uncle of Ka the Kaiser. And he said to the Grand Duke, you must meet Dr. Herzl. And the Grand Duke met him and was very impressed and offered his help and said to him, I will introduce you to the Kaiser. And the Kaiser, in a famous tableau meeting outside the ramparts of Jerusalem, where the Kaiser was visiting Palestine as the guest of the Sultan, his ally, he visited, he received on horseback Dr. Herzl and four or five other Zionist delegates and promised to look at the memorandum and see what he could do to help with the Sultan to give the Jews a charter in Palestine. At the same time, in England sat a brilliant young biochemist with the name of Chaim Weizmann, who did the same thing, made friends with people like Balfour and Lloyd George and lobbied to get also support. And then later, long after Hesselhofer had dead, died already by that time, you're now talking about the, the years before the war and during the war, he did some very successful lobbying. And then you must realize a very important situation. World Jewry was split. German Jewry was pleased with the attitude of the Kaiser or people like the Grand Duke who were friendly. But on the other hand, and also they had one great thing, they were on the other side of the Russian Tsar. And the Russian Tsar, in the heart of the Jews of the time, was almost, not quite, a Hitler, because the pogroms were all done by the Cossacks, by the Russian Tsar. And all these thousands and thousands of Jewish refugees on the east side in New York were refugees from the Tsar. So, in other words, the German Jews could say, we fight with the German army against the Tsar. On the other hand, the British Jews uh, were on the side of Russia, but on the other hand, had their own uh, ideas and were very patriotic British Jews and had reason to be patriotic if the Jews had a very good time in England. And then came that period which is so well described in the book on the sleepwalkers when they were preparing for World War I when in fact both sides were fighting this rivalry about what to, how to get the Americans into the war or keep them out of war. The Germans on the one side and the British. And the German Jews appealed to their Jewish friends in America and don't let forget that the original great Jewish families in America were pro-German, the Salzburgers of the New York Times the Rosenwalds of Sears Roebuck, they sent their children to Berlin and Göttingen and Heidelberg and not to Oxford and Cambridge. And they, of course, were interested in helping the side. So it was a completely confused situation. You wouldn't believe it, perhaps, or don't know it, perhaps, that on the German side was a brilliant young Zionist called Dr. Nahum Goldman, who later in life founded the World Jewish Congress. And he was employed by Hindenburg and Ludendorff to write pamphlets in the Yiddish language for the German army to drop by their hundreds of thousands in Poland, in the Ukraine, to say, Jewish brothers and sisters, help us to fight the Tsar, who is the man who killed your kith and kin. This was the confused situation. And in this race for getting America into the war, the British won the race and Weizmann won the race because he made friends with Lloyd George, made friends with Balfour and got in 1917 the Balfour Declaration. And this is an extraordinary story. And I am in the 
happy position now also to talk to you about Herzl, the Redeemer, because tonight we have some very important distinguished guests. We have the great-grandson of the Grand Duke of Baden, a great friend of Herzl, His Royal Highness Prince Michael. Prince Michael, may I ask you to stand up? We have here today Count and Countess Hardenberg. Count Hardenberg is the great, great, great son of Prince Hardenberg, the Prime Minister of Prussia in the Napoleonic Wars, who raised the ghettos to the ground and legislated the emancipation of German Jews. Andreas, get up. Both the Grand Duke, his royal family, his royal highness's family, and our friend Count Christoph Douglas, and our friends from the Hardenbergs are still continuing in their wonderful collaboration with the State of Israel, helping economically and culturally, and in playing a very important part in the rapprochement between Germans and Jews. I'm very proud that they could come here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, since we have now all these German friends here, I want to also mention Mr. Elmer Brock, one of the leading politicians and leader of the CDU in Strasbourg Parliament, a very influential man, both in Europe and in the Federal in the German Republic. We have here my great friend, Stefan Sattler, one of the leading cultural figures in Germany and right-hand man of Hubert Bose, the publisher, whose father was ambassador to the Holy See and the Adenauer and who converted to Judaism and is married to one of the great Jewish intellectuals in Germany, Rachel Salamander. Stefan, get up. And I, I want to greet Mr. Elmer Brock, I want to greet Frau Seibel, the managing editor of the Axel Springer daily paper, Die Welt, for whom I have the honor to write a regular column, and Mr. Kielinger, the distinguished Axel Springer Welt correspondent in this country, a great intellectual and wonderful journalist. I hope I haven't uh, in, uh, eliminated, I haven't I've, uh, forgotten anybody, but I now have another little surprise for you. I would like to ask my great friend and road companion, Svi Metal, the great philanthropist and great collector of historical memorabilia, who has brought with him copies of a seal of Theodor Herzl's letter of thanks and stamp for the Duke of Baden, thanking him for his help. Svi, will you get up and do your duty? Ladies and gentlemen, I think I have only one passing thought to communicate with you, and this is my last uh, part of my perhaps overlong spe uh, uh, speech. Um, nowhere in the copious, voluminous correspondence published by Theodor Herzl, nowhere in his two great novels, is there any critical word, let alone hostile word, about Arabs or Palestinians. On the contrary, the romantic field of Herzl had the hope that they would be neighbors working together. He thought that the mighty Arab nation under the Ottoman yoke would become free, would turn into a multitude of sovereign countries, monarchies, republics, and there would still be room for a Jewish state next to an Arab state. And he hoped that this Semitic brotherhood, as he put it, cousinhood, as he put it also in another place, would come to pass. And I want to end up with my hope that this will happen and that this last 
most important part of Theodor Herschel's prophecy is one day soon become reality. Thank you very much.